Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives. Our guest today is Ambassador Peter Galbraith, who is a senior associate with the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Ambassador Galbraith. Very good to be with you. Uh, tell us uh, a little bit about your affiliation with the Center, and then we'll get into some of the topics we're most interested in, especially Iraq. Well, when I uh, left government in 2003, I was invited by the Center for Arms Control, which is an uh, educational organization with a pro-arms control approach, to both to join their board and to be uh, a, a senior uh, fellow. Uh, I'm non-resident because I, I live in Vermont and it's in Washington, D.C., uh, so it's, a, it's an affiliation. Uh, much of my work uh, these days, however, is uh, both as an author writing about Iraq and the Middle East, and I have a, a company that uh, does uh, uh, international negotiating and strategies both for governmental and corporate clients. Good. Now, one of the books that comes to mind is The End of Iraq, and that sort of sums up nicely what, what you think about the subject. Could you explain to our viewers today what you mean by that? Well, <coughs> Iraq uh, is a modern creation. It's a very ancient land. It, it, uh, Mesopotamia is known as the cradle of civilization. But the state of Iraq only came into being uh, after World War I. It was a British construct that took uh, three separate Ottoman provinces, uh, uh, which didn't have much to do with each other, and put them together as a state. Uh, and it wasn't put together because they shared something in common. It was a British um, balance of power um, uh, and divide and rule uh, colonial engineering. So uh, they, uh, th this was a land which uh, was about half Shiite, um, about, and the other part of it was uh, Sunni Arab. Uh, who were outnumbered three to one by the Shiites. Uh, and the Shiites refused British rule. Uh, the British therefore took a Sunni prince from Arabia, who Lawrence had previously tried to install as the king of Syria, and the French had kicked him out of Syria. So he was an unemployed Sunni prince, made him king of Iraq. Uh, and, but since he was outnumbered three to one, or his group, by the Shiites, they added then the Kurds and the Valiate of Mosul, which was predominantly Kurdish at that time, to Iraq. Uh, and the Kurds, who are a non-Arab uh, people, uh, never wanted to be part of Iraq. Uh, uh, they thought they'd been promised an independent state by Woodrow Wilson, uh, and they were in basically constant rebellion. So what you've had, uh, and, and the way in which uh, Faisal, the, the king, ruled, was to create a, a bureaucracy dominated by his fellow Sunni Arabs, uh, and an army led by his fellow Sunni Arabs. And basically the way Iraq was ruled from 1921 until April 9, 2003 was by a succession of Sunni Arab dictators who ruled through the army, through the Sunni-dominated bureaucracy, and after 1968 when the Ba'ath took power by the Ba'ath Party and the intelligence services. And in effect what the, what the Sunni rulers did was to keep the Shiites down and the Kurds, who were ne never wanted to be part of Iraq, used force to keep them in. Uh, that system began to unravel in 1991, after Saddam was defeated in the first, in the first Gulf War. Uh, and the Kurds, uh, both the Shiites and the Kurds, had an uprising. The Shiite uprising was put down very brutally. The Kurdish uprising was put down, but then the first President Bush intervened to create a safe area in northern Iraq, uh, and that became uh, a, a de facto independent state uh, in, in a hostile relationship to the rest of Iraq for as long as Saddam was in power. But then after the liberation, it basically consolidated its de facto independence. So you have a, an independent Kurdistan in the north, um, both and, and incidentally where no Kurd uh, uh, wants to be an Iraqi. I've never met an Iraqi Kurd who, if given a choice between an independent Kurdistan and uh, a Kurdistan that is part of Iraq, would prefer to be part of Iraq. So your, your idea then is from 
the way it was originally constructed, it was impossible for it to well, work. Well, it or, might have or, been possible in a different system, uh, a, 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 a confederal state or a federal state, uh, one where th these different peoples were fully represented. But as it turned out, it basically was a Sunni dictatorship uh, for 80 years, uh, a very brutal one, uh, committed genocide against the Kurds, massive repression of the Shiites. And so when the, when the U.S. came in in April of 2003, got rid of the last Sunni dictator, allowed looters to destroy the bureaucracy because the Bush administration had no plan to provide security, then fired the top bureaucrats who were uh, Sunni Arabs, Ba'athists, uh, uh, defeated and then dissolved the Iraqi army, uh, eliminated the security services, made the Ba'ath Party illegal, the U.S. unintentionally uh, destroyed all the ways in which the Sunnis had ruled and all the ways in which Iraq was held together. So the Kurds, as I said, they continued to have their independent state. The Shiites and the uh, Sunnis, uh, both of them would say they're Iraqi, but they have very different ideas as to what that means. And so you had a civil war between the two groups. And even though the violence in the civil war has now much diminished, the, there is no shared idea of what Iraq should be. So these recent elections, that held provincial elections held in the Arab parts of Iraq, not incidentally in Kurdistan, the Shiites voted for Shiite parties, the Sunnis for Sunni parties, and virtually nobody crossed, voted for parties that crossed the religious divide. So at, at this particular point, especially now that the administration has changed in the United States, um, what, what is your recommendation as to how we should proceed with Iraq? It is, it inevitable that it is the end of Iraq in, in your mind and how quickly, if that's the case, will it happen or do we have a period of, uh, of uncertainty ahead that won't necessarily go immediately to a uh, dissolution? Well, I, th I think there are two separate issues here. One is the interests of the United States and the second is the, the future of Iraq and the interests of the different peoples of Iraq. Uh, I've been very critical of the Iraq war uh, because I have felt that it was a diversion of U.S. resources from the central challenges to our national security. And what are those central challenges? Well, above all, uh, an unstable nuclear-armed Pakistan threatened by uh, Islamic fundamentalists, uh, uh, and Iran and North Korea both pursuing, well, North Korea clearly pursuing and having achieved uh, nuclear weapons capability, Iran pursuing uh, uh, the, uh, a nuclear weapons capability, if not nuclear weapons, uh, the, and of course the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, whereas Iraq was not a threat to the United States uh, and had no programs uh, of weapons of mass destruction, which was in, wasn't clear that they had no programs before the war. It was clear they didn't have a nuclear program, and that, that's, a, that's a critical point. Now the second issue is what's good for the, the peoples of Iraq. And sometimes uh, I annoy uh, other critics of the war by pointing out that while the, the Iraq war has been a disaster for the United States, it's actually improved the lives, in my opinion, of most of the peoples of Iraq. After all, 80% of them are Shiites or Kurds, two groups that were brutally repressed by Saddam Hussein. The U.S. got rid of them. Uh, as to the uh, the future of Iraq. Well, the first point I make is that the end of Iraq is no tragedy. Uh, you know, the, there isn't any reason why the current 192 states that exist uh, on the globe today, why they should continue indefinitely. Uh, states are not divine creations. They're creations of men and women to serve human needs. And if a state doesn't serve those human needs, uh, then what's the harm in it disappearing? The world is definitely not worse off for the fact that the Soviet Union is gone. Or for that matter, I, uh, as I was the first U.S. ambassador to Croatia, the world's not worse off for the fact that Yugoslavia is gone, even though it, it had uh, aspects to commend it. Uh, the real problem is violence. That's what we want to avoid. And so uh, there's no reason to mourn the end of Iraq, but there's a very strong reason to make sure that the the breakup of Iraq is done with the minimum amount of violence. Uh, there's also a misconception here. Uh, people assume that the breakup of countries, uh, say of Iraq, is going to be destabilizing and cause violence. But sometimes 
It's the holding of a country together by force that is destabilizing and, and produces violence. That's certainly the case of Iraq. Uh, it was the, the necessity of brute force, therefore of a large and brutal army and its security services, that created a kind of militarized state under Saddam Hussein that not only was bad for the various peoples of Iraq, but which launched a war of aggression against Iran in 1980, a war of aggression against Kuwait in 1990, and uh, all the associated disasters. So tell us what you think will happen next, um, and, and to what extent what happens next depends on the, the new administration in the United States. Well, the, 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 I think President Obama it has the, is on, on the right course uh, because he is withdrawing from Iraq. Uh, and the reason he's withdrawing from Iraq is simply that it's a, a diversion of resources and he's reallocating them to, among other places, uh, Afghanistan and diplomatic and economic resources to Pakistan. So th I think that, that course of action is correct. Now, the, he he has a, a fortuitous circumstance in the sense that violence in Iraq has declined from the horrendous levels that it was in um, uh, 2006 and 2007, uh, although it's still actually quite high. Uh, and, uh, and, and so he, he does need to focus and is focusing on what will happen as the U.S. withdraws. Uh, and what, what, what the U.S. needs to be concerned about the, the, this issue of the relationship among the three groups. There, has, there's, there, there remains great potential for violence. In, as between the Sunnis and the Shiites, uh, there is the unresolved issue of the awakening. Uh, the awakening are Sunni militias that the U.S. funded uh, starting at the end of 2006. Um, sorry, uh, uh, in 2007, uh, which uh, 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 took on Al-Qaeda, uh, which is a Sunni organization, existed only in the Sunni Arab areas, uh, and defeated it. But uh, even though the tribal leaders who led the awakening uh, uh, hated Al-Qaeda, they actually hate the Iraqi government uh, more. And so if the Iraqi government tries to take over the awakening or doesn't treat it with respect, doesn't pay the salaries, there's a danger that the awakening will end up fighting the Iraqi government. There's also the risk of conflict between the Kurds and the uh, 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 Shiite-led government of uh, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. The Kurds more, had until recently more or less stayed out of Iraq's conflict in this decade. Uh, uh, they had had their own independent state and they've been maintaining it. But there are territories that are disputed between the Kurds and the Arabs as to uh, who should control them. Mostly these are territories that once had uh, a very large Kurdish population in which uh, successive Arab regimes, notably Saddam Hussein, expelled the Kurds, settled the Arabs in their place. Now with Saddam gone, the Kurds are coming back. Uh, the Iraqi constitution says there's supposed to be a referendum in these places, but the Arab government is refusing to implement the constitution. So what, what do you think is the worst case scenario that could emerge over the next six months to a year? There are a lot of worst case scenarios in Iraq and, and the history of the place is that most of them have come true. But I think that the, the, the probably the worst case is that the, the relations between the Arabs and the Kurds will deteriorate, so they'll be fighting between these groups, which had not previously been at, at war, at least not since uh, 1991. Uh, and so that will add a new dimension to the conflict in Iraq. Um, there had been indications in recent months that they were very close to that kind of violence, but then seemingly stepped back. Um, was that your reading of? of yes, I think, I think that's right, but it remains a very volatile situation. Uh, uh, there's, the, of course, the, at the center of the disputed territories is the dispute over the city and province of Kirkuk, uh, which uh, the Kurds claim at one point even proclaimed to be the capital of uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, and uh, which, of course, uh, 
is sits astride uh, above, and just a, a few feet above, one of uh, the world's largest oil fields. Uh, the control of Kirkuk has been a subject of conflict between Iraqi governments and the Kurds since 1920s. Uh, and finally, in the constitution that was adopted by 80 percent of the peoples of Iraq, uh, they had a formula for resolving it. But now uh, the Maliki government's not implementing that formula. So it, it certainly remains uh, volatile and, and could erupt. Uh, you have a situation where the city of Kirkuk and, the, and most of the province is controlled by the Kurdish military called the Peshmerga. But there are Iraqi army units, Arab units, that are in the vicinity uh, who believe that they have authority in the area. And uh, so the, the prospects for a clash could occur really at any time. And, and if that were to occur, what, what would the likely outcome be? Do the Kurds have the capability to deflect a, a sustained conflict with, with the Arab forces? Uh, I don't know. It, I, I don't know the answer to that either. For a long period of time, between 2003 and until very recently, the, the Kurdistan army, the Peshmerga, was more powerful than the Iraqi army. And certainly the Kurds have the ability to defend the territory that everybody agrees is Kurdistan, that is the territory uh, which is west, uh, east and north of, of the Green Line, the ceasefire line between Saddam and the Kurds going back to 1991. But how they would do on the plains of, uh, of, of Kirkuk against the Iraqi army, I, I don't know. Uh, but it, it, uh, and I hope we don't find out because it has the, the potential to be a very bloody and, and dangerous conflict. In the interest of, of negotiating a, a peaceful settlement to this, to this issue, do you think the Kurds would be content to stay within what you said has been traditionally regarded as Kurdistan? Well, it's not, it's not what's traditionally regarded as Kurdistan, of course. What's traditionally regarded as Kurdistan depends it's, on who's uh, yes, doing the right. regarding. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, th there is a legal definition of Kurdistan in the Iraqi Constitution, which is this this green line. But uh, the Iraqi Constitution itself envisions that Kurdistan would be larger by virtue of of uh, of these referendum and and in fact a, a process by which Arabs who had been settled in, in in Kurdish homes would be voluntarily repatriated and the Kurds would get their property back and would be able to return. Uh, I I think that I think clearly Kurdistan is is and should be larger than what's on the map uh, as defined by the Green Line, but is not going to be as large as what the Kurds want it to be. And, and so there's going to have to be a process of negotiation, of compromise, uh, and also uh, a process in which there's power sharing uh, in Kirkuk and other mixed areas between the Kurds and, and the other populations, Arabs and the Turkmens, who are, who are ethnic uh, Turks who uh, also live there. Hey, you are the, the Kurds, incidentally, are quite open to these mm -hmm. power sharing arrangements. You are expert in negotiating these difficult situations. Um, if, if you were in charge of the process, what, what um, not how would you precisely arrange things, but what would be the broad parameters for resolution of this that you would recommend? Well, the trouble with territorial deals is that they, they're by definition zero sum. So somebody gets the territory and therefore somebody else doesn't get it. Whereas if you have other matters that are negotiated, economic agreements, they're essentially about money and who gets how much money, and you can, you can compromise. I mean, you can get 40, I can get 60, or it can be 50-50. Uh, but we, we all, all of us will leave the table with something. That's not true in the, or it's much less true in the case of a, of a territory. Um, I, I, I think it's a very bad practice for not to implement a constitution that was agreed. Uh, and so the starting point ought to be what is stated in the Iraqi constitution. That, after all, is a, a norm that both sides accepted. Um, and, but then push for compromises. Uh, uh, make clear to the Kurds that they aren't going to get as much as what they might feel they, they rightly claim by, by way of history or even demography. 
uh, and at the same time uh, bring the Arabs along, as I said, to implement the, the Constitution. Again, I would look for ways to try and give everybody a stake in the outcome uh, so that even if a territory became part of Kurdistan, uh, the Arabs and the Turkmens who lived there would have a, a major role in the local government, even outsized representation in the Kurdistan parliament, outsized representation uh, in the Kirkuk provincial government. Um, and certainly this needs to be the subject of sustained diplomacy. I uh, think that once uh, Ambassador Chris Hill is confirmed as President Obama's choice uh, for U.S. Ambassador to Iraq, uh, a man who's incidentally a, a friend uh, that I worked with from the days of negotiating the Bosnian peace agreements in the 90s, uh, that this, this needs to be his first priority. Uh, and he is a very widely recognized, skilled negotiator. So do you envision that in, in the intermediate term, uh, Kurdistan will become a separate country? Well, it is today a separate country in all regards except international recognition. It has its own parliament. It has its own elected president. Um, it um, uh, flies its own flag. It has its own army, controls its own borders. Uh, uh, until recently, it was illegal to fly the Iraqi flag there. The Iraqi army is not allowed to be there. Uh, under the Iraqi constitution, Kurdistan can make its own laws. Uh, and with a very few exceptions, if there's a conflict between Iraqi federal law and Kurdistan law, Kurdistan law prevails. So the issue, I mean, in many ways, it has more independence than, say, the member states of the European Union have, uh, because they're subject to regulation issued from the uh, from Brussels. Uh, so <clears throat> as to the date and timing of formal independence, uh, I, I, I don't see that as being on the immediate horizon. But what's clear is that the moment the opportunity arises for the Kurds to declare independence in, in the territory of northern Iraq, that they will do so. Uh, just like uh, uh, the Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians all had their desire for independence. They, they couldn't achieve it for uh, 50 years, but when the situation in the Soviet Union allowed, they immediately declared it when, the, when they got their chance. The Kurds will do that when the, when the opportunity is right. Uh, it is a distinct nation of people with a shared identity, shared language, a shared sense that they want to be independent. Um, and certainly there's no moral argument against uh, uh, Kurdish independence. Uh, it's a pragmatic one, uh, and fortunately, and, and, it, and, it, and it focuses on the ra rather narrow question of the formalities of Kurdish independence. At what point do they you know, apply for membership to the United Nations? Uh, and at the moment, anyhow, the, the current leaders are not pushing that. You've been associated for so long with Iraq, in, in, at least in recent years, that people expect the next step for you will be something that involves Iraq, but that's not the case. Um, where are you headed shortly? Uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations has named me as his Deputy Special Representative to Afghanistan. This will be a, a, a challenging assignment, uh, and it will certainly uh, test whatever skills I have as a negotiator. Well, we thank you for coming today. Wish you luck with your new assignment. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Brucia, and we'll see you next time.